Greetings, everybody. Nice to be back here again. Last week, I was up at Orr, Minnesota, speaking to many of our young juniors up there, and uh, we had about as many, uh, well, neighboring church people from surrounding churches that had gotten some distance to be there, and some parents, I think, also, as there were students or children. So we had quite a little crowd up there last week, and the week before that in Cincinnati, no, let me see. Yes, I guess it was Cincinnati before. I'm losing track. We've been around so many places here lately that I'm sort of losing track. Um, from Cincinnati, we went right on into New York where we had a meeting on Sunday with some people that uh, I think are taking over Quest magazine. And I think that Quest will be closed up. Let me see. Today happens to be the 4th of July, doesn't it? Well, I think it'll be closed on the 15th. And that is going to mean a saving to the work of some $4 million a year. And with inflation, it would probably have run four and a half or $5 million next year. I'm glad that that can go into additional telecasting, broadcasting, additional publishing, and getting the gospel out to the world, which Quest was supposed to do but never was allowed to do, although it had been started with the supposition that it would. And I find that contracts were made with the editors and people that there would never be anything religious in it whatsoever, although promises were made to me that there would be. Well, at least we'll be rid of that. Now, next Sabbath, let me see, we're going back to Charlotte, North Carolina, where a group of churches will, in that area, We'll all meet together. And on the following Sabbath, I hope to go up to Vancouver, British Columbia for a number of churches in western Canada, and perhaps some from northern Washington will be up there. Then during the following week, I will be again to this next session of the children up at Orr, Minnesota, on the way to Europe. And then on the Sabbath of that week, which will be, I see, it will be three weeks from today, a combined service again for the churches in England, somewhere in London. And I think the Sabbath after that in Germany, with a service of people from Germany and Holland, perhaps Belgium, and uh, countries, at least German-speaking countries, and I think there may have to be some German translators there. And then to at least one of the churches in France and perhaps down to Switzerland. Then back home and speaking to a group of young people at Orr, Minnesota, on the way back or the final uh, group at Orr for the summer. We're having three groups up there this summer, by the way. And the second group was just starting this week, and I will speak to them, God willing, on the way back over to England and Germany and France, and then to Orr, the next group on the way back. After that, I hope we'll be back here with you again. And so it will go. Now, I've been speaking the last several times I've been here, and in other churches also, going right back to the beginning in the Garden of Eden. And God has been revealing new truth to us 
It's not new truth, it's truth that's been new for a long, long time. But God's truth is always new, by the way. It never gets old. It's not old truth. It's perpetually new. But a lot of it is new to us because we hadn't seen it before. Now, it's all been in the Bible. But you know, the Bible is like a jigsaw puzzle. I'm sure you all have worked out a jigsaw puzzle at one time or another. It's a large picture. Sometimes it's all oh, about so big, and sometimes they're smaller. But it's cut up with a jigsaw, with little curly cues all here and there, in about anywhere from a uh, hundred up to uh, uh, quite a little more than a thousand different pieces, all curly cues around in different ways, and you have to put them together. And they're cut in such a way it's very difficult to know what piece goes next to what other piece. Now, when they're unscrambled, you don't see any picture at all. You don't realize there's any picture there. And yet, there is a picture there when you get it all together. And when you get them into place, one next to the other where it belongs. Now, the Bible is like that. I've often start, thought of starting to explain that in Genesis 1, verse 1. And in Genesis 1, verse 1, to explain and go to other parts of the Bible that talk about the same thing and throw additional light on what is there, well, I would go next to John 1, 1. In fact, from John 1, 1 to John 1, verse 4. And to make it even still more clear, I think I would go on to verse 14 in John 1. And then I think I would go to the third chapter of Ephesians in verse 9, where the Word who became Jesus Christ was really the maker of all things, how God made all things by Jesus Christ. Now, the Word of John 1.1 1, 1 was with Christ, and he was also God. I mean, he was with God. He uh, he became Christ, but originally, when he was thus called the Logos in Greek, or in the English language, it's translated into the word, word, which means spokesman, revelatory thought. He was God, and he was with God. It's just like John can be with Smith. But John is also Smith, because he's the son of Smith. Now, at the time of John 1.1, 1, 1, the Word was not yet the Son of God. I wonder if you realize that. He did not become the Son of God until he was born of the Virgin Mary, and that's only a little over 1900 and, oh, about 1980-some years ago. And then he became Christ. But originally, he was the Word, but he also was God. Now, back in Genesis 1, verse 1, you find in the beginning Elohim, and that was written in the Hebrew language, and the word for God, translated in the English word into God, is there, Elohim, which is a uniplural noun, like the word family, or church, or team, or group. More than one person forming one group, or more than one person forming one church, or one family. God is only one God, but there's more than one person in God. And you find that if you go to John 1.1, 1, 1, that explains a lot about Revelation 1.1, 1, 1, in the beginning, God. Elohim, you and I, plural. That's why when you come to verse 26, God said, not let me make man in my image. God said, Elohim, the uni plural, more than one person, said, let us make man in our image. Now, as you go on through, you can explain a great many other things from other parts in the Bible. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and it should be plural, heavens, not heaven as it is in the King James. You'll find that other translations, as far as I know, I think about all of them, give it heavens, plural. In the Hebrew, Moses wrote it plural, heavens, not one, just heaven. There are three heavens mentioned in the Bible. 
to heaven where the birds fly and where we fly in airplanes today, then the heaven which is above that, which we call outer space today, where our astronauts have gone, and where the other planets exist. And then the heaven of God's throne. And I think that is sometimes called the third heaven. That's not necessarily still farther away. It is a third heaven, and we don't know where that is. There's only one place in the Bible that gives us an idea, and that's in the, uh, let me see, in the uh, 14th chapter of uh, Isaiah, where it speaks of it as being in the far north, and I think it is referring to the throne of God and God's heaven at that place. Now, as you go a little further, you find that that throws a great deal of light on what is in Genesis 1.1. The very next verse begins to lead to a lot of other things. And the earth was without form and void. Now, you go back to the Hebrew words, and the word, the, the world was, or the earth was, and in this case it means became, because the same Hebrew word is used became in other places in Genesis. It came to be, would be a better translation. Now, without form and void, the English words translated from the Hebrew words tohu and bohu, and that means chaotic, in confusion, waste and empty, a condition of decay. Now, that is not a newly conditioned, uh, a newly created condition at all. A thing doesn't become decayed when it's first made or first created or first brought into being. It comes to be decayed later. And then you have to go to the 14th chapter of Isaiah, the 28th of Ezekiel, and you have to go into Second Peter 2 and verse 4, and you have to go into many other scriptures in the Bible to begin to learn why it had become that way and what had happened. Many of the scriptures fit in there before you even get to the next verse. Now, that's the way the Bible is. And if you're going to understand the Bible, you have to read it like that. And you have to find a part here, a part there, and a part somewhere else that fits into the Bible. Or into the beginning in Genesis or any other, other part of the Bible. Now, again, you must put the Bible together. Every verse that modifies it or describes it or goes along with it and fits in with it like a jigsaw puzzle, one piece fitting next to another, you must get every other scripture in its context and not put a different meaning on it. Because you can take a certain part of a scripture, a whole sentence or a part of a sentence, and make it mean something else. Now, that is like the old preacher. I don't almost call him a Methodist preacher, but I'm not sure he was a Methodist. He might have been a Presbyterian, Baptist, or something else. Back in the time of our great-great-grandmothers about, in other words, this probably was back in the latter part of the 19th century. And uh, we're living in the 20th century. And... Uh, there was a new fad in women's hairdo. I think you've heard me tell this before, but I know it's been some time. The younger girls had a new hairdo. They were doing their hair up and doing it around in a top knot, just slightly forward from the middle on top of the head. Now, frankly, I've seen uh, women's hair done that way, and I don't like it very well. I, I don't think it's very beautiful. And so you don't see many uh, women doing it that way today because I think they don't think it's very beautiful either. And you know, a woman's hair is really her glory physically. And uh, a woman can just change her whole appearance by changing the way she does her hair. As I say, I, I, usually you don't see any two women who do their hair up the same way. Well, I think every woman should do it the way that is more becoming for her and that fits her face better. And I guess that's the way most of them do. 
and that's all right. But anyway, this preacher was preaching a scorching sermon. He was preaching a corrective sermon that Sunday morning. And of course, it was Sunday morning. And uh, he was scorching these young women with that new modern fad. Told them to take that top knot down. He says, my sermon this morning, my text is found in Matthew chapter 24, verse 17. You can turn to it and read if you want. Matthew 24, verse 17. Top knot, come down. Now he says, young woman, God says for that top knot to come down. And he preached a whole sermon on that one scripture. It does say top knot, come down there. Because Christ is talking about a time of trouble coming when he says that he that is on the house top should not come down to take anything out of his house. So the top not come down is there all right. But that isn't what it means in that context. So you see what I mean. In understanding the Bible, you take a little here, a little there, a little somewhere else and put them together. But you've got to know that you get the meaning as it is in its own context and see that it makes sense put together with the other scripture in its context until you have a complete picture. And that's the way the Bible is. Now, if you start to read the Bible and you just start in Genesis 1-1 and you start to read the Bible through, and I've heard people say, well, I know about the Bible now. I've read the Bible all the way through from beginning to end. Well, you know... I was brought up in church until I was 18 years old, and Sunday school. Now, I didn't know what the church believed. I did know some things. I know uh, that they believed, and I believed, and I just took it for granted that I was an immortal soul, that I would live forever. If I died, that uh, uh, I'd pass on or pass away out of this body. And if I'd been good, I'd go to heaven. If I'd been bad, I would go to hell but I was going to live forever because I was an immortal soul or else I had one or something. I didn't know which. Well, I had to come to find that I was all wrong. And I know that after I was married, when I was age 25, a marriage that lasted, well, 50 years from the time we fell in love and were engaged, and it just like three months and 15 days exactly, you being 50 years from the marriage date. But I'm, I'm sure we'd been in love with each other for that long because we were engaged some little time before we were married. Most young people are or used to be or should be. And anyway, uh, my mother sent us a Bible right after we were married. Now, I didn't read it so much because I was a slow reader, but my wife was a more rapid reader, and I thought we'd get through it quicker if she read it. And the main thing was just to get through it. Because I didn't understand it anyway. She'd read it, and to me it was just like saying da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da. I didn't get anything out of it. And if you start to read and read through the Bible, verse by verse, chapter by chapter, book by book, you will not get the meaning. You just won't get it that way. Because what you read in one place must be put together with some of the things that you will read in other places. And I didn't know that then. Now, it wasn't until I was, well, let me see, it was in 1926, and I was 34 years of age, that I was challenged and for the first time began to look into the Bible because I thought it said something that didn't, and I wanted to make it say something that I wanted it to say. Of course, I was quite disappointed, because I said it didn't say what I wanted it to say at all. Then I began to learn something about the Bible. But I've learned all of that since I was 34 years of age. I was really a biblical ignoramus before that, or a biblical illiterate, whichever way you want to say it, the first 34 years of my life. I did know that we'd gone through the book of Proverbs in Sunday school. Instead of the usual quarterly, as they called it, or the Sunday school lesson that the church used in all the other Sunday school classes, 
our boys' class, and we all grew up together from little kids up until I was 18, all together, to the boys' class. I don't know where the girls were. They must have had a class of their own or something, because I remember we were only boys. And we had a young man teacher. To me, we thought he was quite an old man, but as I look back and think now, I think he must have been in his young or not over his middle 20s. But uh, we all liked him. And so we just went through the book of Proverbs. And when we finished the book of Proverbs, we went back and started going through the book of Proverbs again. And after that, we went through the book of Proverbs again. Now, that's about all I knew. But that did put one thing into my mind that I wanted to have understanding. And I know when I was five years old, my father said I was going to be a Philadelphia lawyer when I grew up because I always wanted to know why. I wanted to know how and whether and everything else about anything. I wanted to understand it. I asked so many questions. Well, you know, I didn't know then I would be a Philadelphia lawyer someday when I grew up because here I preach the law of God and the government of God in the Philadelphia era of the church. So I am a Philadelphia lawyer, am I not? So my dad was right. Oh, yes, I tell you, years 18 to 20, I, I, I felt sorry for my father. I, I knew more than he did. And then he moved out. We were living in Des Moines, Iowa, and my father moved out to the West Coast, first to Idaho and later out to Salem, out to Salem Oregon. And uh, so I didn't see my father anymore from 1920 until 1934. Or I mean, from 19... Uh, now, let me see. Uh, 19... Uh, yeah, 1930. When I was 20. That's what I'm... It was 1912 until 1924. In other words, it was uh, from 12 to... Uh, the 24, yes. So 12 years later, when I saw my father, I had a lot of respect for him because he, I, I, I found he'd learned so much in that 12 years that he now knew more than I did. But I didn't know that when I was 18 or 20. And, of course, a lot of boys 18 or 20 are like that. They, by that age, they know more than their parents do. But... Nevertheless, now, I'm, that's all just a prelude to what I was going to get into for a sermon today. I wanted to tell you a little something about the Bible. And I was wondering, I, I've been going back to those two trees in Genesis, and that's the foundation of everything in the world. If you want to know why anything is like it is today, why is the world like it is? Why do we have the kind of world to live in that we do have today? You have to go back to that time. And I've been de developing a lot of time to that recently. And I wanted to get to something else today. Well, I thought about whether I should bring you a message on prophecy. Now, I'd like to get back to the prophecies once again. And I think it's about time that we do. And I think that I shall very soon. But it just seems that the way things have been breaking, I haven't been able to speak here just regularly every Sabbath. And I, I don't get in here but about once every f three, four, five Sabbaths. But perhaps I will sometime soon. But there is another type of subject. I found years ago up in Eugene, Oregon, before we even started Ambassador College and before I ever moved down to Southern California, Pasadena, that just taking one chapter in the Bible and going through that chapter verse by verse could form a very good sermon, the material for a good sermon. Now, once I remember up in Eugene, Oregon, I had not had time to prepare a sermon, and I was caught short and didn't have time. And so I simply told the congregation that Sabbath, that uh, I would take a chapter in the Bible and go through it. And I said, now, why don't I let one of you select a chapter and I will go through it and expound it? 
Well, there was a Sardis minister there, and he did not like me. And I have told you, the Sardis ministers persecuted me. The Sardis brethren all loved me. But their ministers did not. They felt competitive, and they did not like me, and they persecuted. And this man was sitting in the front row. He says, Mr. Armstrong, may I suggest that you preach on the first chapter of Isaiah? I said, fine. All right. You know, for the minute, I didn't know why he wanted me to preach on that. I just remembered one thing. Though your sins be as crimson, they shall be white as snow. I knew that was in that chapter, and the rest of it, for the minute, I just did not remember. But I knew he had some motive. I didn't know what it was and wanted me to preach on that. Now, I had been taking the truth about God's annual holy days to the Sardis people, and they had rejected it. And he wanted to lay a trap for me, just like the Pharisees did for Jesus. He wanted to trip me up and trap me, and he thought he had me there. So it came to where God says in the first chapter of Isaiah, as I was going through it, that God hated, or wherever it is, why don't I just turn to it for a minute? That isn't what I intended to preach on today at all, and I'll get to something else in a minute. But let's uh, let's go back to that. Just a second. I just want to show you. It's rather interesting. And I think that if we just get to something interesting like that for a change, it'll be a little bit of a change of sermon material here, and uh, I think it'll be good uh, for all of you. I, Isaiah, the first chapter. I didn't have it marked because I hadn't intended to use it. But uh, he says, To what purpose is the multitude of your sacrifices? And uh, by the time I got to that point, I believe that's the place, I was emphasizing the word your. It was their sacrifices that God was against. Unto me, saith the Lord, I am full of burnt offerings of rams and the fat of beasts, and I delight not in the blood of bullocks, bullocks or of lambs or of goats. Now let me see. Yeah, then th verse 13. Bring no more vain oblations. Uh, incense is an abomination unto me. The new moons and sabbaths the calling of assemblies I cannot away with. Uh, it is iniquity, even the solemn meeting. Your new moons and your appointed feasts my soul hateth. They are a trouble unto me. I am weary of them. Your appointed feasts. And I put the your, that they were, their, they were not God's appointed feasts. And did I wallop that minister in the front row? I said, that's just it. I said, you want to have your camp meetings. You want to have your ways. But God's holy feasts, God's holy days, you don't want to observe. And so his trap came right back on him. But God has always helped me in a case like that. Well, I just wanted to explain a little about that sort of thing. And today I thought I would do that. I would not only take a chapter, perhaps I'll continue on later, that I would start in the book of Hebrews. Now, I find that it's been almost 20 years ago, 19 or 20 years ago, in England I started a series of sermons on the book of Hebrews. And I believe I continued it even here in Pasadena at that time. Well, that's almost a generation ago. And then I had a long series of programs on radio. And that series of programs on the book of Hebrews was repeated on radio about a year or so ago. I haven't been following it in the last year. I don't know just what they've been running just recently, but... Uh, if I may say so, yeah, I, I, I thought that was a fairly good series, an interesting series of television or radio programs, rather. And uh, I think it 
may be repeated again, because it was not dated, it's not timed, it's just as good now as it was 20 years ago. But I think we need some of that again. In other words, the book of Hebrews is the book about Jesus as our high priest. Now, one might ask this question, what has Jesus been doing this past 1900 years? Is Jesus dead? Well, he died. But your Bible and mine says he rose again. And he's not dead any longer. Now, the last we saw of him, he ascended up to heaven, and a cloud received him out of their sight. And that was about ten days before the day of Pentecost and forty days after his resurrection. But where has he been since? What has he been doing? He has been very much alive. And he's been doing something for us. And he is the head of the church, but he's not a dead head of the church. You know, that reminds me, I was having a luncheon one time, I was holding a series of meetings up in Yuma Pine, Oregon. And uh, there were some Seventh-day Adventist people up there, and one of them had come to one of my meetings. Of course, they didn't come to more than one of them, but they, they came to one and to invite me to their home for, uh, 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 I think it was a Sabbath or a Sunday dinner. And uh, so I accepted. I went. Well, of course, they got into an argument with me. And uh, they talked about their having a prophet in their church. And uh, they said, well, Mr. Armstrong, does the Church of God have a prophet? I said, oh, yes. Well, you don't have a... I said, Jesus Christ is our prophet. Oh, well, well, I said, we mean a living prophet. Do you have any living prophet? No, I said, do you? Because Mrs. Ellen G. White is their prophet, and she died quite a while ago. And they looked at one another rather astonished. They had forgotten their prophet is dead. I said, your prophet is dead, but our prophet is still living. Our prophet is Jesus Christ. He is the head of the church. He's the greatest of all prophets. And he still today is living, and he's the head of the church. But where is he today? He ascended to the right hand of God in heaven. And there he has been the high priest of the church ever since. Now, he's not the high priest of the world. The world rejects him. And even individual Christians are not members of his church, and they reject him as the head of whatever church they belong to because he is not the head of any other church but his own church. And if they're not members of it, he's not the head of their church. That's all there is to it. And his church is fitly joined together. It is compacted in every joint, just as if it is welded together, solidly bound together and organized. And the organization is explained in the 12th chapter of 1 Corinthians and the 4th chapter of uh, Ephesians. And how God has organized his church. And it is an organized body. That is not a human organization. It is a spiritual organism, and yet it is well organized. Now, I might just say, by way of a little news that I might put in right here, that in the past week, the board that I have surrounding me now, in the human level of the church, at the headship of the church, the leadership, is an advisory council of elders. And in this past week, we have been going over a constitution and forming, and carefully going over every line and sentence and paragraph of the constitution and bylaws of the Worldwide Church of God, an unincorporated spiritual organism but it is organized and well-organized. Now, the unincorporated Worldwide Church of God 
does have a number of corporate entities under it, one of which is the Worldwide Church of God Incorporated, a California corporation. We are incorporated, actually, in a number of states. But the only members of the corporation are merely the officers of the corporation. But the generality of the church are only members of the church of God. In other words, we're all children of God and church's congregation. It is an assembly, a group, family. We're the begotten family of God, not yet born. Now, there are plenty of born-again people all around that don't know what born-again means. They don't know what Jesus meant by that word. But in God's own church, we do know. But we are begotten of God. And we do have the promise of being born of God. And it's too bad that others cannot understand that. And that we're in the process of spiritual growth, of overcoming Satan and this world, coming out of this world, and of growing in grace and the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, and also of enduring until the end of this life, or the end of this time, whichever comes first. And so, God has given us that understanding, because this is the church of God, and it is based on the Word of God and the foundation of the church. We find in Ephesians, the third chapter, that the foundation, the apostles and prophets, is founded on the apostles and the prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. But it is fitly joined together. And Christ pictured it in the 15th chapter of John when he spoke about himself being divine, and we are the branches. But did you ever notice that the branches are all joined to the vine, and the branches are joined to one another through the vine? Through Christ, we're joined to one another. They're fitly joined together. You break one of them off and let it go alone, and it's also broken off from Christ. A lot of people that want to be lone Christians say, well, I don't have to belong to any set church. Well, God has one church. He doesn't say, I will create several different groups of churches. I will build my church and the gates of hell will not, or the gates of the grave, which it should be translated, shall not prevail against it. Now, he did build his church and the gates of the grave have not prevailed against it. It's still here. We have a number of congregations, but we're all organized, we're all together. And we do all speak the same thing. And that one thing has to be what Christ speaks, and Christ is the Word of God. He is the spokesman. Well, now, finally, I'll get around to what I was going to speak on for a sermon today. We come back to the book of Hebrews. But speaking about prophecy, I do want to get to it, because... Uh, before I start this, I want to say another word. I'd like to just sort of talk to you a little bit today. I don't get to do that very often. Lately, I've been coming with a plan, set sermon. I try to stay right on, right on the beam and not sidetrack with something else. And uh, I, I think I've been doing that fairly well lately. All my life, I've had to try to avoid getting sidetracked and jumping off onto some of the thought that will flash in my mind as I go along. But to say right on the subject, well, I've been doing that lately. But today I just wanted to say what comes to my mind. That's what I'm doing. And uh, I just want to talk to you as one of you. And we need a t time to talk like that and be together because we are all one in Christ. But speaking about prophecy. How many of the four million people that exist on earth today do you think are still going to be alive when Christ comes? Now, I think Christ is coming very, very soon, because all of the prophecies and everything in the Bible that has 
to do with the time of his coming and the conditions of the world at the time of his coming show that we're in the very last days just before the actual coming of Christ. Now, by that, I don't mean he can come tonight or tomorrow, because a number of things have to happen before that. At least there has to be a three-and-a-half-year period. There has to be a great tribulation that is coming. There has to be the fourth part of what we call the day of the Lord, and the day of the Lord is when God intervenes and begins to supernaturally intervene in the world's affairs and take over prior to the coming of Christ, and then he will take over completely when he comes. But even prior to his coming, there are going to be frightful signs up in the sky. There are going to be plagues. And, you know, you will find that a tribulation is coming on this nation, and one-third of our nation is going to die of disease epidemics resulting from famine. In other words, famine and uh, the uh, disease epidemics that will follow. Pestilence, as it is in Matthew 24. And again, back in Ezekiel, in the, you see, in the fifth chapter, I believe it is, of Ezekiel. And our cities are to be destroyed. Then another third of our people are to die by military warfare, which in our day now means nuclear warfare. Our cities are to be destroyed. Isn't it significant that the cities are to be destroyed? Most of the people who are living in cities today, they've moved off of the farms, and it is cities that can be destroyed now by hydrogen or, uh, yes, hydrogen bombs, atomic warfare. And that was never possible until our time. And just since World War II has that become possible. The United States did not have another atomic bomb when Hiroshima and Nagasaki were bombed. Now, the Japanese didn't know that. They wouldn't have surrendered if they had known that. They didn't. They thought there were going to be more, and so they surrendered before any more of their cities were bombed. But we could not have bombed any more of them, because we didn't have another atomic bomb. The only two we had were used. But you might say it was a bluff, but the bluff worked, and they surrendered. But soon after that... They began to announce the, the hydrogen bomb so great that an atomic bomb only triggers it and sets it off. I don't know, what is it, a hundred times, a thousand times more powerful and more devastating, something like that. I haven't kept up on the technicalities of those things as I used to even. But then if you read in the plagues that God is going to send... At the end of the Great Tribulation and in that time, how many people are going to die of, in other countries and all over the world? I want to go into that again myself. Because I think we need to go into what is going to happen between now and then, all anew and all afresh. Because somewhere between... A third and 90% of all living people on earth today are going to be dead before the second coming of Christ. Did you know that? That's the kind of time we're living in. And very few people know it. Now, I want to go back into prophecy once again. I was going into prophecy on radio 30, 40 years ago. I was about 30 or 40 years ahead of my time. Well, I tell you, the Apostle Paul and the original apostles were way ahead of their time by 1900 years. They thought the coming of Christ was going to happen right then in their time and their lifetime, their generation. They didn't know it was more than 1950 years later. But it was... 
Well, I sort of misunderstood the time a little bit, too, but not as much as they did. But we are in the last days. Now, we can't set dates. You certainly have learned that. I did not ever set a date. Believe me, I never did. And I kept emphasizing I did not set dates, and yet many people took it that dates were set and acted accordingly. Well, I was talking a great deal in those days about a place of safety. Now, again, I was several years ahead of my time. No question about it. But we're just that much closer to it now, and I want to go back into a study of those things. Now, a lot of people decided that uh, everybody's going to go to uh, Petra, as they call it, over in uh, the land where uh, it exists. Which is the land of Jordan, the kingdom of Jordan. And uh, I think uh, in Europe they call it Petra, but whichever way you pronounce it. Which means stone, and it's, it's quite a stony uh, place, a mountainous place, and very rocky and very stony. I spent a couple of three nights over there, about 1956 I believe it was, in a cave inside of the rocks. And, uh, well, if you have to get up in the middle of the night, that's quite a provoking place to be, as I found out. Because it's, it's rather, even in the summer, it's rather cold nights over there. No, it's, it's not a pleasant place to be either. It's a sightseeing place in a way, because the mountains arrangement and all of those caves and some of the things that... Uh, the carvings that uh, they've actually carved a facade of buildings out in the front of one building that was on right in the mountainside in the rock. But it is not a pleasant place, believe me. Now, if that's where we're to go, you're not going to like it. And yet a lot of our people want to get to Petra. Oh, can we go to Petra or to Petra, whichever you call it. Well, now, get that right out of your mind because it's not a pleasant place. I will just say this, if the Bible tells us where we're to go on the two wings of the great eagle, and the Bible does say that we will do that, that is where we would go, but I'm not sure the Bible tells us where we're going to go. So you still can't be sure of it. But it, if, if that is not it, then the Bible does not tell us, but God will show us in his due time. But we're getting near that time, and I do want to go back into those things again. So now I've just had a little talk with you for quite a while now, and it's all right, because I start in this book of Hebrews, I can stop at any verse I want to. So uh, let's begin now in the first chapter of Hebrews. Chapter 1, God, now that's speaking of the Father, who at sundry times and in divers or different manners spake, un, uh, spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets, hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things. Now, I want to stop right there and comment on that a while. And we have to go to a few other scriptures. You can't understand the Bible if you just go right on without knowing what is in other scriptures that uh, uh, have something to do with it and say the same thing. Now, a while ago I had it. When you drop, you lose something, you can't find it. Look on the floor. That's where it would probably be. Anyway... The prophets that spoke unto the fathers. Now, the fathers go back prior to the time of Christ, don't they? Well, now, in the days of Israel and of Judah, and prior to the time when Judah was taken captive and became a slave people and no longer a nation, the prophets who wrote were Moses and Samuel, Isaiah, Jeremiah. Uh, I'm not putting them in order. I just jotted some of these down. Uh, Hosea, Amos, 
Micah, and David in the Psalms, and uh, uh, Solomon in the Proverbs, and Hosea, as I mentioned uh, Amos and Micah, and Hosea, and uh, Joel, and Zephaniah. Now that is all before the fall of Judah. Some of those wrote in the days after Israel had been taken a captive and taken away, but Judah was still there with its capital in Jerusalem. Now, second, there are two very important prophecies that were written in the captivity when they were slaves and their message did not go to the fathers back then, but are only retained for the church today, Ezekiel and Daniel. They wrote during, they were slaves and in the captivity. Ezekiel was among the captives on the river Kibar, and Daniel was in Babylon. Now, 70 years after the captivity of Judah, a number of Judah, not any of Israel, but a number of Judah, and it's only a few of Judah even, And Judah consisted only of the tribes of Judah and Benjamin and Levi. And it's only a part of them were sent back to Jerusalem to build the second temple. Now the temple that Solomon had built had been destroyed finally by 580 B.C., beginning with uh, 604 and on down to 585, and I think it finally was finished by 580 B.C. But 70 years later, a colony was sent back to build another temple under Zerubbabel. Now, Zerubbabel was a governor. He was not a prophet, incidentally. But the prophets of that time were Ezra and Nehemiah, Haggai, Zechariah, and Malachi. Now, they did right for that portion of Judah that had gone back. But the great ten tribes had long since, over a hundred years before Judah's captivity, had gone north and west, or northwest, to western Europe and northwestern Europe and the British Isles. Now, many people don't know that. They don't know where they went. They're called the Lost Ten Tribes. But it is interesting to know that and and to know the order of these prophecies. Now, the prophecies, for example, of all of Israel, many of these prophets prophesied after Israel had been taken captive and were only prophets to... uh, the the kingdom of Judah after Israel had gone into its captivity. Now, there are some other prophets that didn't write books of the Bible, uh, like, uh, for example, uh, like, um, oh, why can't I think of the names that I want? I always get stumbled on names that I try to remember. I can remember scriptures in the Bible, even names in the Bible. I often can't re- uh, remember. But uh, Elijah, I was thinking of, was a prophet, and Elisha. But uh, they didn't write books. You don't find Second uh, Elijah 6, verse 7. You don't find that in the Bible. And, uh, but it is interesting to notice that. And yet we find that the church is founded on the apostles and the prophets, Jesus Christ being the chief cornerstone. Now, I want you to get this. Now, I have to go back to Ephesians, the second chapter, to pick up that scripture that fits in right here. And to understand this, we need to know all of that. And yet, you only find, let's see, about four prophets mentioned in the New Testament. One was an elderly woman, past 80 years of age, who picked up the infant child, Jesus, took him in her arms and blessed him as just a little infant, and then went on and apparently died soon, and nothing more is heard of her at all. 
there was a prophet by the name of Agabus, and God spoke to him and used him to carry a message to one of the apostles, to Paul, and telling Paul that God sent a message to him that if he went on to Jerusalem where he proposed to go, that he would get into trouble in Jerusalem. Well, Agabus told Paul. Now, Paul didn't doubt that. But Paul went on anyway, and he did get in trouble. A great deal of trouble. That's where he appealed finally on to Caesar, and, and, and later went on his very perilous trip to Rome. He had a shipwreck on the way at one of the places where we're going to have a Feast of Tabernacles this year, the island of Malta, just south of Italy in the Mediterranean Sea. And we'll have a feast site there this year. So that's a rather historic place. And uh, anyway, there were two other prophets at least who, to whom God revealed that they should lay hands on Barnabas and Saul and anoint them as apostles and send them as apostles to the Gentiles. Now they did that. But they didn't contribute any doctrine or any belief to the church. They didn't have an administrative position in running the church or administering the affairs of the church in any way. Not any of those four apostles did. Or, I mean, four prophets, excuse me. Uh, so there were no New Testament prophets that had anything to do with being founders of the foundation of the church. So it refers to Old Testament prophets. Now, every one of these Old Testament prophets are quoted in the New Testament, and they are a part of the foundation of the doctrine and of the belief of the church. The whole of Ezekiel and the whole of Daniel were written for the church and were never given to the people of Israel while they were a nation. They were written after Israel and Judah were both slaves in captivity and were not a nation and were not ever proclaimed to Israel and Judah under the Old Testament. And how important is Daniel to the book of Revelation? How important is Ezekiel to understanding many of these other prophecies and of knowing the things we need to know in our time? And yet those books never were given to Israel or Judah while they were a nation. And there was no way for one of them as a slave to get his writings to the rest of them who were scattered here and there as slaves. So it's good that we know that. But every bit of the Bible that is written is the word of God. Even the word of these type prophets. And even though God and... Uh, uh, spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets. What he spoke and what is recorded in writing in the Bible is part of the word of God. And who is the word of God? The word of God, John 1, 1 and verse 14, became flesh and dwelt among us and became Jesus Christ. So it is the word of Christ. Regardless if it was that God was speaking to them, beginning with Moses, it also is for us and for the church today. So just notice that as you go along. Now, the second verse, God has in these latter days spoken unto us by his Son. Now, his, you will notice, is an italic in the King James and uh, and some of the other uh, uh, translations uh, by a son or his son. And uh, uh, that's all right. I think his son is very good there. At least the, the translators of the King James put it there. Whom he hath appointed. Now, God the Father then appointed Christ, what? Heir of all things. Now, the Moffat translation translates all things to mean the entire universe. The entire universe. So Christ is the heir of the whole universe. All right, Ephesians 3 and verse 9, God created everything. God created 
the world by Jesus Christ. He is the one by what now? Christ is the Word of God. He spake, as you read in one of the Psalms, and it was done. Well, the power that did it when Christ spoke was the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the Spirit that comes from Christ and from God. Not a separate person, but a power that emanates from them. So, now notice this, that Christ then is the heir to inherit the whole universe. Well, God used him in creating it all. By whom also he made the worlds, that is, by Christ. He, God, made the worlds. There again, God made everything by and through Christ. Now verse 3, who, being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person. Now, some of the other translators have that a little difference. Stamped with the very character of God in the Moffat translation. Stamped with the very character of God. The express image of his person. But image sometimes means character. God made man in the form and shape of God, God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness. We are made like God in form and shape, and we're made to become in his very image in the sense of his character. But we were not, God did not create Adam in, in, in God's character. But God gave him a chance to come into God's character through the tree of life, and Adam rejected that and took the forbidden fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil and said he would go it alone without any help from God. The express image of, the, of God's person, or in, in his very character, is stamped with the character of God the Father, and upholding all things. Now then, I'd like to read that. I have the... Uh, let's see. I have here the Revised Standard Translation. And I have to use two or three different magnifying glasses. I have to use a little stronger one for this Bible. Um, he reflects the glory of God and bears the very stamp of his nature. Now, Moffat says of his nature, I mean, uh, the Revised Standard says his nature, and Moffat says of his character. Upholding the universe. Now, all things means the universe, and here the Revised Standard tells it the universe, upholding the universe by his word of power. In other words, the power that is in his word. He speaks the Holy Spirit performs whatever he speaks. The entire universe. Now, I want you to notice that all things here means the universe by the word of his power. When he had by himself purged our sins, in other words, by his death on the cross, Jesus had purged our sins to reconcile us to God. Now, our sins have cut us off from God. And we could not get back to God because he had shut up the tree of life, in other words, the Holy Spirit, until Christ came. But when Christ died, his shed blood reconciles us to the Father. Now, to understand that, you have to go back to the fifth chapter of Romans. And you will find there that the blood of Christ does not save you. A lot of people don't understand that. A lot of preachers will preach the blood of Christ saves you. It doesn't. The blood of Christ forgives your sins up to the minute of your repentance and the minute of your belief and acceptance. But it does not forgive any future sins you commit tomorrow and next year in advance before you commit them. It simply does not. And the blood of Christ doesn't save you. The death of Christ can't give you life. Life can't come from death. Life comes from life. And so you read in the fifth chapter of Romans that we are reconciled to God by the death of his Son. 
not saved by the death of his son, reconciled to God by the death of his son, but we shall be saved by his life, by his resurrection, and we'll be saved by a resurrection. Now go back and read the fifth chapter of Romans, and you will understand that. So you see, you have to fit in other parts of the Bible with this as you go along to really comprehend it and understand it. So he purged our sins, reconciling us to God the Father. Now, on the other hand, does that mean that just anybody can say, all right, I'll go and ask Christ to reconcile me to God the Father? Oh, no. Because Jesus said, no man can come to me except the Father that sent me draw him. And in the first chapter of Ephesians, you learn that we in the church were predestinated before the world was predestinated to be called now by God. And it is only those that God the Father calls and draws through the power of the Holy Spirit who can come to Christ. Now, the Pharisees came to Jesus with trick questions. And someone might come to me with a trick question. Mr. Armstrong, they would say, here is a man that really sincerely in his heart wants to come to Christ and to come to God and wants to obey Him and wants salvation and wants to come out of the world and wants to have God's Spirit and live God's way. Do you say that He can't come to Christ unless the Father draws Him? Yes, I do. Well, then, is He shut off? No. Well, what then? Well, I say, if He does want to do that, the Father did draw Him, didn't He? Or he wouldn't want to. You get the answer? Well, what about the world? They don't want to. And any man who does want to wants to only because the Father did draw him. But you take most people, they don't want to. Now, go back to the time when I first gave myself to God. I gave up trying to disagree with him. I saw I disagreed, and I saw he was right and I was wrong. But instead of saying, I get Christ, I appropriate, I accept Christ, and I'm going to get and take, I said, I will give myself to him. He bought and paid for me, and I belong to him. So, I did. But I gave myself to him. But I know now that he had drawn me and called me. Otherwise, I wouldn't have wanted to do that. But what do you think is the first thing I did? Oh, I was so filled with happiness about it all, and the truth that had come and God had revealed to me was so wonderful that I just wanted to share that right away with those closest to me in the family and my relatives. So I went to them. I was just all an eager beaver. I was all enthusiastic. I was all lit up with it. Now, you see, my wife, when she first learned about the Sabbath, came and said, oh, I must go tell Herbert. He'll be glad to hear this. That was a wonderful truth to her when she saw in the Bible, we must keep the Sabbath on Saturday instead of uh, observing Sunday, which is not the Sabbath. Well, I didn't want to hear it. I didn't like it a bit. God used that to start drawing me, but he hadn't drawn me very much yet. But after six months' intensive study, and I saw how wrong I was, and I proved that God exists, and I proved that the Bible is his word, and I saw that I disagreed with it, and I saw that he was right, and everything he said made sense, and everything I believed did not, then I, well, I received his word with joy and happiness and enthusiasm. And I wanted all my relatives to believe it. And they thought I was insane. They thought I'd gone crazy. They said, what's happened to you? Well, I don't want any of that. They didn't want any of this truth at all. No, you see, God had not drawn them. And some of them are still living, and he has, still hasn't drawn them, even to this day. How many of you have had that experience? When you were first converted, you wanted to get members of your family and others that were close to you, and you wanted to get them the, the truth to them, and they wouldn't have any, have any of it. They just thought you were crazy. 
And that's the way it is. The natural mind of man, the carnal mind, which is the mind we're born with, is enmity, which means hostile, against God. Is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. That mind has to be changed and receive another spirit. There is a spirit in with your brain that imparts the power of intellect to your brain. But you are only half there mentally. You're on, you only have half of a mind. You need the spirit of God to complete your mind. That's the other half and the more important half. And without that, you, 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 you find that the things of God are foolishness to you, and your mind is not, is, is just hostile against them. You're not subject to the law of God, which is God's way of living, neither indeed can be. And that's the way it is. Now as we go on through this, we see all of these things. When he had purged our sins, and as I say that only reconciled us to God the Father, sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high. Sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high. Now why did he do that? Why did he go up there? Why didn't he just, he had qualified, he had overcome Satan. He had qualified to restore the government of God. He had qualified to sit on the throne of the world and to establish the kingdom of God, and to be the ruler over the whole earth. Why did he not take it then? Why had God waited 4,000 years before the second Adam came, and God had shut up the tree of life, and shut up the Holy Spirit from man? And man has a mind, and God created that mind. And as God created it, it's hostile to him. But the first man, Adam, had a right to make a choice. And he had a, an opportunity and a right and a command from God to take of the tree of life. And he could have had a whole complete mind, but he didn't. And when he sinned, he brought death on himself. And Satan was there. And Satan had got to Adam through his wife Eve. And his wife Eve was the first woman of the uh, ERA movement. You ever think of that? That started back with Mother Eve. And the women still want to wear the pants. I've mentioned, I'm just trying to think where I mentioned that the other day. I know I was speaking to the, all the visiting ministers the other day, just a few days ago. And I was mentioning how the wife of one of our evangelist rank ministers one of our oldest ministers in the church, I mean, in, not in physical age, but in years of service and being in the church. And, of course, both of them graduated from Ambassador College, he and his wife, years and years ago. And I think their children are aged to be in college now, maybe are. I forget how many of our uh, former students now have children in Ambassador College. But I remember I asked her one time, I said, did you ever try to be the boss in your home and wear the pants? And she looked kind of funny, and she began to grin a little bit, and she said, well, yes, once. I said, oh, once. And did you find who the boss was? <laughs> she said, are you telling me? I sure did. Well... I've had two wives, and the first one was my wife until death, as she should have been, either one of whom is perfectly capable of being the boss, but neither one has been. And I think that's the way it should be, but a husband not only should rule his wife, he should rule her in love and in patience, and in kindness, and absolute consideration for her in every possible way. It's like just while we were in conference this week, my wife called me on the telephone. And they told me later that she called, so I called her back. 
And she uh, she said, well, I called you, but I didn't want to interrupt you or in conference. I said, well, my wife always gets into me no matter where I am. She said, well, I knew that, but I didn't want to interrupt just the same. Well, my wife has always had a privilege that other women don't have, some way. I've wanted to treat a wife with love, with kindness, with consideration, and with honor, and to give them every honor like that. And I think every husband should do that. But the husband still is the head of the wife. And if he can't be the head of the wife, there's something wrong with him somewhere. And he should be able to be the head of the wife. But he should be in all love and patience and kindness and goodness in every way. Now, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. Oh, yes. So I was saying, why did God then wait 4,000 years for the second Adam? And even after the second Adam came and purged our sins, now the first Adam, as I say, he had sinned. And Satan was still there. And the world sort of overlooked Satan. And so their children began to sin. None of the sins of Abel are recorded, but we know he did sin because they are specifically are not recorded, but in general they are because another scripture says all have sinned, and that includes Abel. Cain sinned. He was a murderer and killed his brother, and then he lied to God about it. And he got punished too, didn't he? But his punishment, God's punishment, is corrective and intended to correct us and to help us. And his punishment is in love and not in hatred or vengeance or wanting to see us suffer. God doesn't want us to suffer. God doesn't have hate. He has love. He, he hates evil. He hates wrong things, wrongdoing. But he doesn't hate people. But then Christ, even after he had qualified, after he had conquered Satan, he went up to heaven at the right hand of God as our high priest. Why? Why is God waiting for 6,000 years before he gets rid of Satan and before he establishes everything on the earth? Why? Because man had to learn. And man has not learned yet, by 6,000 years of man's going the wrong way, that his way of life is wrong. I was just saying to another minister this morning, well, look, what's wrong with the way the world's living? Why isn't trying to get the best of everything right? Well, it's good for you, and look how much more you get if you try to get everything, take it away from the other. And if the other man suffers, you don't feel it. It doesn't hurt you. So why isn't it all right for you to let him suffer? Well, you got to worry about whether he suffers or not. How do we know that God's law is better? Satan argues that competition is better than cooperation. I have been in conferences of businessmen. And in, in uh, not just conferences, but in, in, in meetings of businessmen, conventions, where the speaker would say, competition, not cooperation, is the life of business today. Well, that's what businessmen believe, competition. In sports, everything is competition. Let's get the competition going. We want competition. Satan wants competition. Satan is the number one competitor. The world still thinks competition is a better way than cooperation. Now, God's law is based on cooperation. Satan's law is based on competition. And yet some of you right here still think you like competition. How about it? God knew that if humans did not have time for generation after generation to learn the lesson, to let them go the way they want to and let them suffer and let them find out the result of their way, they would never believe it. 
I tell you that if God had, had corrected things in Adam's time and before other children were born and fixed it all up for Adam and let Christ come and pay his debt for him, say, now, Adam, it's all right, you go right on. They would always have believed Satan's way is better. But let me tell you, after 6,000 years, and even then, they're going to have to see in 1,000 years of millennium of living to prove that God's way is better, people would never believe it. Now, God has known what he's doing. God is building us to be, he's reproducing himself in us that we can be stamped with his character even as Jesus was. And his character is knowing that his law is a way of life and that that is the right way and that no other way is right. And how many of us have been living in the way of this world and going the way of this world and doing the things of this world, the practices of this world, the games, the sports, the social life, the amusements of this world. How many of us like the amusements that you see on television or in movies? You like the, the entertainment of this world. Do you think Bob Hope for a minute thinks that his telling jokes is bad? He says, look, I make people laugh, and that's good for people to laugh. I'm helping people. I'm doing a lot of good. Now, he really believes that. I'm sure he believes it. Bob Hope has been on this stage more than once. I think he was here the day that Bing Crosby was here. And let's see, yes, I'm, I'm really, I'm not on the stage. I'm on the orchestra pit. They could let me down right out of your sight real quick if someone wanted to join the right button. I didn't realize that. I'm out here in the orchestra pit that lets up and become part of the stage. Well, it was down. And Bing Crosby was back on the stage and didn't realize he stepped over too far, and he fell down, all the way down. And he landed on this platform that I'm sitting on, but it was way down below then. And Bob Hope had to get a joke off, and he quipped, and he says, Well, so I'll tell you, Bing, if you've got to take a fall like that, it's at least nice to do it in a place of class like this. So... I know those great entertainers realize, and they're considered great by the world, they realize this is a place of class. It's really a, a very fine place, a very beautiful place. No, God had to know that it did take time, and that's why Christ has gone to heaven to be our high priest. And this other 2,000 years, it's more than 1,900 years and 50, 1950 years now has gone by since the death of Christ. And it's getting to be almost 2,000 years since the birth of Christ. I don't know. We're going to have to go up until 1994 and be an exact 2,000 years before Christ comes. I don't know. You might think about that, but don't, don't go believing it because I just happen to say it. But he sat down on the throne of God with the majesty of the whole universe on high to become our high priest. Because God needed to let them know those things. Now, God raised up prophets. He began to give his truth to ancient Israel. He raised up a nation. He made them actually, in a sense, his wife, but he did not give them the Holy Spirit. In other words, the tree of life was still closed up and not open to them. But God did begin to open it just a little bit to a few prophets. God opened it to Abraham. And God then opened it to Isaac and to Jacob and to Joseph. And then we find that God opened the tree of life to Moses. One man at a time. Later he opened the tree of life to others to lead God's people. Samuel. And after Samuel, to David. And to others. 
and to those that he could use in writing his word. And then finally, after 4,000 years, he sent the second Adam, Jesus Christ. Christ came and paid for the sins of the world. He paid for Adam's sin. He paid for Seth's sin. He paid for Cain's sin and Abel's sin. He paid for your sin and mine. And for those yet to be born, so far as that's concerned, and those who will be born in the millennium even. He came to qualify for the kingdom of God. Now, God had used a few prophets. He showed that people, if they had God's truth without his spirit and a complete mind, that with a carnal mind, they still would be hostile against God, and they were in ancient Israel. Then Christ came, and he started now the church, and it started out with 120 on the day of Pentecost. But that same day, 3,000 more were added. And then God had added... Right along every day for a little while, those who were to be saved, that he added to the church. Then persecution set in, and a false gospel set in, and the true gospel then was uh, uh, was simply uh, what's the word? I never can think of it. Uh, but it never went to the world any longer. They sent a counterfeit gospel out instead of, instead of it. They began to preach about the messenger, Christ, instead of the message he brought from God. And his message was the gospel. And then there were not so many more added to the church. Not as many as there were in that first flush of those first days, the first two or three years. And persecution set in. And now God is raising up more in his church in this latter time to have a people ready for his name. And there will be several thousand having the Spirit of God that when Christ comes, they will be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye to immortality, or the dead in Christ will be raised first and rise and meet him in the air and come down with him on the Mount of Olives that same day. We will be the ones that will sit with Christ on his throne. That doesn't mean we'll all be sitting on some kind of a throne over in Jerusalem either. But we will be ruling under Christ as he rules the world and rules over all nations. Present rulers will be put down. Then Satan will be taken out of the way. And Christ will be ruling. And we'll have to get the word of God out to the, all the world and those who remain. As I say, there may be so many that will die between now and that time or will be killed or destroyed between now and Christ's actual coming that maybe only 10% of the people now living will still be alive when Christ comes. And he may come within six or seven years. Maybe he'll come within four or five years. I can't set dates. But I know he's coming comparatively soon. And I don't think he's going to wait until 1996 either. But he could. I don't know and you don't know. But there will be enough to be the rulers and to teach the rest of the world the way of God and there won't be any Satan to overrule them. And God has let Satan be here. And God has let the world live that way to prove by heirs of God and people that can be begotten and then born into the very family of God that the wrong way has not paid that it has only brought human suffering and agony and despondency and frustration, unhappiness, suffering and misery. And the whole world will have learned that lesson ultimately. Now, in the meantime, Christ is up there at the right hand of God as our high priest. 
Now it goes on to tell how great Christ is. Let me see how the time is getting along. It's getting along about time that I stopped. And I, I've only gotten a few verses here in Hebrews. If I go through this whole book of Hebrews, how long is it going to take me at this rate? You see, if you put in the things from other parts of the Bible and expound these scriptures as you go along, there's so much more to any one scripture than just that one verse itself. And someone just read right through, they don't get the meaning. I hope the next time you read these first, how many verses have I had here? About four verses, that's all. Yeah, the first four verses. Being made so much better than the first three verses. Sat down with his majesty on mine. I think I'll stop right there. Because Christ has been sitting there ever since to help you and me to be the head of this church, to guide this church. You know, it's a funny thing. So often I wake up in the morning and it just seems like Christ, well, he is the word of God who does the speaking, like he is speaking to me and getting the message through to me. And the fruits of it later, late uh, afterward have proved that it was Christ speaking so many times. He still works with us in the church. He still protects this church, and he still is feeding this church. And he's preparing you and me to grow spiritually and in spiritual character, to be stamped with his very own character, that we can rule with him when we begin not only to rule the world, but to save the world. And that's when he will begin to pour out his spirit on all flesh. Now, he started pouring out his spirit on all of the flesh that were there present on the day of Pentecost. But that's only the first fruits. But all flesh is going to be a lot more, and it's going to take a lot more. A lot more time and a lot more people. Then finally, of course, will come the great white throne judgment at the end of the thousand years. God's work won't be completed for quite a while yet. A lot more to go. And you and I are going to have to go on living quite a while. And we're going to have to work through that whole thousand years and that whole millennium. Are you coming out of this world like you should? Are you praying like you should? Is your whole heart in your prayers? Now, it isn't just praying. It's how you pray. I tell you, there was one, one man who prayed a great deal. He's the man who prayed to God and says, God, I want you to know how good I am. Look how much better I am than this publican and sinner right here beside me. Poor guy. He's, he's just a humble guy, but he's nothing. But look, I tithe. I do this. Look how good I am, God. I want you to know. He, he prayed a lot, that man did. But, you know, I don't think God heard his prayers. It isn't how much you pray. On the other hand, if you only pray about two minutes a day, that isn't going to do you very much good either. But I'd rather see you pray two minutes with your whole heart in it than to pray two hours like that rich man with a publican and sinner next to him. Now, if you pray a long time and a long prayer and your heart is in it, that's the best of all. Now, when you read the Bible, read it and study it and study other things that go with it and other places in the Bible and let, let your mind call to your mind as you read it things in other parts of the Bible that come to you at that time. That's what I've been doing this morning. I did practically no preparation for this message this morning. But I have to already know all these other scriptures. And you should know them. And study the Bible in that manner as well as just reading through it. And, 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 and go a little slower on any one verse. Well, now maybe I'll get to finishing this first chapter. But wait till, oh boy, wait till I get to that second chapter of Hebrews. How much there is there. I've written a whole book on that. A whole big book. So there's an awful lot in it. And we'll continue on with that later. Now, I, 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 I thank you very much for your prayers. And I know you are praying for me. And I do need it. I seriously need it. I need it from a physical point of view. 
I am handicapped, but I'm going on just the same. I have to use a magnifying glass even at the typewriter now. And it is a severe handicap. But I'm so fighting along to get the work done, and I need the help of your prayers. So stay there on the firing line. So keep building that character, keep praying, keep studying your Bible more than you ever did before. Let's come out of this world and be separate. Let's grow in grace and the knowledge of God. So until next time, I'll break off there. For more information, please visit our website at www.coglittleflock.com.